Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who set us the solitary in families, we commend to thy continual care the homes in which thy people dwell. But far from them we beseech thee every root of bitterness, the desire of vain glory, and the pride of life. Fill them with faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness. Knit together in constant affection those who in holy wedlock have been made one flesh. Turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to the parents. And so enkindle fervent charity among us all that we may evermore be kindly affectioned one to another through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, welcome back after a brief break last week. Um, we are in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to take a look at verses 3 through 5 today, really. So if you have your Bibles, you'll want to open them to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Paul writes, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. For I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands." I said when we first started this study of 2 Timothy that this is a particularly personal letter that Paul was writing. Most of the letters that Paul wrote, we said, were written to churches, generally speaking, and oftentimes they were written to churches that Paul had established. This is not like that. This is a letter that is written to an individual. I laid out for you the circumstances behind the letter, that this was a very dangerous time, I guess is the best way to describe it, in the life of the church. Uh, Paul himself was imprisoned in Rome, uh, waiting trial before the emperor. He was most likely going to be executed. Indeed, he, this would be his final uh, imprisonment in Rome. He would ultimately be executed. He would be taken out probably shortly after this letter was written along the Ostian Way, the main entrance into Rome, and there he would be beheaded. He wouldn't be crucified like the others. He would be beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. But the reality was Paul's own ministry was drawing to a rapid close when he wrote this letter. And the whole future of the Christian church was basically hanging in the balance. There were all kinds of mystery religions, competing religions that were appearing on the scene. Uh, furthermore, Paul knew that the church was under the cross. It was under the sword. Um, the Emperor Nero had started a systematic purge of the church, and many of the early believers were being put to the sword. And so Paul knew that this fledgling faith, this Christian faith for which he had labored for decades, was in danger of being stamped out. And he knew that if it was to survive, he had to pass on the baton of leadership. And he was going to have to pass that baton of leadership on to someone else, and he had chosen to pass it on to his young friend and protege, who was the pastor of the church in Ephesus, this young man by the name of Timothy. And we talked about who Timothy was. We said Timothy was about the polar opposite in terms of personality from the Apostle Paul. He was young, he was sickly, he was shy, he was reticent, he's what we would call an introvert. And yet he was the man to whom Paul was going to entrust the responsibility of carrying on the gospel ministry in these dark and difficult days. And so we said this is a very touching, it is a very moving, it is a very intimate letter. And we get a taste of that intimacy here. As Paul begins the letter, he thanks God for the ministry that he has. But he also thanks God for the ministry, and in particular, he says, for the sincere faith that resides in this young man, Timothy. Timothy may not have had many of the things from a worldly point of view that we would say are necessary in order to be successful. As I said, he didn't have the physical constitution that Paul did. He didn't have the experience that Paul did. He wasn't as courageous as Paul was. But what he did have was a sincere faith. And I think before we ended the last time, I reminded you of what that English word sincere means. 
It comes from the Latin meaning without wax, that in the ancient world that they would make pottery, and every now and then pottery would break, and so some people would mend the pottery with wax. They would fill in the cracks with wax, and when it would dry, everything would be solid. And then they would paint over it and sell it off to some unsuspecting buyer until that buyer took it home and then put hot liquid in it. And then what happened to the wax? The wax melted and it fell apart. And so, in an effort to remind people that they could trust the maker, they would stamp the bottom of the pottery with the word sincera, without wax. And that's where we get the word sincere today. And so Paul is reminding uh, Timothy of the sincere faith that dwells within him. But what's interesting is he just doesn't talk about this faith as though it was something that had just welled up within Timothy himself. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, verse 5, a faith that dwelt first, what? In your grandmother. In your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. You may recall when we started this study that I pointed out to you that Timothy had a Greek father, but he had a Jewish mother. He was converted on Paul's first missionary journey when Paul and Barnabas went to the town of Lystra, a town, incidentally, where Paul faced great persecution. He was actually stoned and dragged outside the city in an unconscious state and left for dead. So it was not an easy time in Lystra. But the wonderful message is that the word of the Lord never comes back void. That's what the prophet Isaiah says. The word of the Lord never comes back void. It always prospers in the purpose for which it was sent. And even though Paul faced great persecution in Lystra, his word did not come back void or empty. It made an impact on the lives of some people. In particular, we know on these two women, Lois and Eunice. They were devout Jews. And because they knew the Old Testament scriptures, they were prepared. Their hearts were fertile ground for the gospel message that the Jewish Messiah, the long-promised, long-anticipated son of David, had finally arrived. And they embraced this faith. And Paul is telling us that they passed that faith on to Timothy. That's a wonderful thing if you think about it. We can be thankful for Timothy because if Paul had died and not passed this faith on or the responsibility of carrying on the ministry to Timothy, you and I might not be here today. But we can also thank God for Lois and Eunice because if they had not passed on the faith to their son and to their grandson, Paul would have had no one to pass the ministry and the responsibility on to, and you and I would not be here today. You know, we, we think about the great heroes of the faith. We think about people like Billy Graham. Billy Graham has preached to more people in the world, preached the gospel to more people than any person who has ever lived. And lives have been transformed. I can't tell you the number of people over the course of my life that I have met who came to know Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. I think of uh, Dr. John Guest, who is a great evangelist, an Anglican who preached my institution, and John came to know Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. But you have to ask yourself, who introduced Billy Graham to Jesus Christ? As much as we can be thankful for Billy Graham, we can also be thankful for whoever it was, the unsung hero that introduced Billy Graham to Jesus Christ, that he might pass it on to you and to me. And this reminds us, I think, and I want to take a little bit of a detour today, but this reminds us, I think, of the importance of family ministry. There is no environment that has greater potential for good or for ill than a family. It was the faith of the family that was passed on to Timothy that Timothy ultimately passed on to others and that eventually was passed on to you and to me. So today I want to talk a little bit about the faith of our fathers and our mothers and the importance of family ministry. Now I hope I'm going to get through all of this material today, but you know how it is with me. I get going and so I'm not making any promises. If we don't get through it today, we'll come back and finish it up, God willing, next week. But I want to talk a little bit about the importance of family and the importance of family ministry and the importance of passing on the faith to our children. There are many things that we can pass on, and indeed many things that we do, some good, some not so good. But the most important thing that you and I can pass on to our children is the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. 
It's the most important thing that we can pass on to them. But before you start talking about children, what's the old song say? Love and marriage. Love and marriage. You got to have love and marriage before the baby carriage. So let's talk a little bit about marriage today. At least that's generally the way it's supposed to work. Let's talk a little bit about marriage. Why do we need to talk about marriage? Because marriage is the first great Christian institution. And I would put to you that it is foundational. It is foundational to society as a whole. Marriage. If you go back to the book of Genesis and you read through Genesis chapters 1 and 2, one of the things that you will notice is that as God creates, He pronounces a benediction on each successive act of creation. We're told that God looks on what He has made and He says, It is good. It is good. It is good. Finally, He creates man in His image and He looks on man and He says, It is very good. So God is pleased with what He has made. But when you get to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God looks upon the creation and He says that one thing is not good. Everything that He's made is good. It is good. It is good. It is very good until you get to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. When God looks on everything that He's made, He says there is something that is not good. Do you know what it is? He says it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. So what does God do? Well, what God does is He creates woman to be the helper and, and to be His, not just assistant, it's not that, the one who compliments Him. The way that the story describes it, and you're not meant to take this literalistically, but the story is that God calls, caused a sleep to fall on Adam and He took out one of His ribs and He created the woman from it. It simply means that this is bone of his bone. This is flesh of his flesh. She compliments him. He is incomplete without her. And she is incomplete without him. They complement each other. And that is the beginning. God presides over the first wedding there in Eden. It's not good for man to be alone. So that's the first thing God does. What's the first commandment that God gives? I always tell this to young married couples when they're premarital counseling when they're coming in. I always ask them, this is a test, what is the first commandment in the Bible? The first commandment in the Bible is, go and have sex. <laughs> After you're married, go and have sex. What does the text say? Be fruitful and multiply. That's what it means. And fill the earth. So God looks upon what He's made, and there's one thing that He notices that is not good. And what is not good is that man is alone, and so He creates the woman. And these two complement each other. But then, the first thing that they are supposed to do is what? Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and make a family. And it soon becomes apparent, as you read through the text of Scripture, that this marriage relationship this family relationship is foundational. It's the first institution that we find in the Bible and all of the other institutions that we know flow from it. Think about this for a moment. Where is the first education done? The first education is done in the home. And it's the basic education. It's the education that is necessary before you can have all the other forms of education. It's in the home that a child learns to what? To walk. It's in the home that the child learns to talk. It's in the home that the child learns to feed himself or herself, to dress himself or herself, to conduct himself and herself in a way that is respectable, in a way that is acceptable. And it's out of this basic education that all other forms of education come. If you do not have those basic things, you cannot go on to the higher forms of education, can you? So it's out of that basic education that takes place in the home that all formal education develops. Even schools, colleges, universities. But it starts where? It starts in the home. The first health care is done in the home. We teach our children to do what? Wash their bodies. Scrub behind your ears. 
Brush your teeth. Eat your greens. And we are teaching them all of these things. Why? Because we are teaching them the value of health. That the body is a gift from God. It is not just a shell to be done away with, as the Greeks used to believe. But it is a blessing, and you are meant to be healthy and to care for your body. Comb your hair, brush your teeth, trim your nails, whatever it may be. We are teaching them these things. And it's out of that that a value for health care develops. It's out of the care that takes place in the home that hospitals and hospices and clinics eventually develop. If you think about it, the first form of government that children are ever exposed to is where? In the home, where their parents teach them. In the ancient world, this was primarily patriarchal. The father had a right, and the father ruled or governed his family. And it's from this form of government in the family that all other forms of government have developed. Patriarchal forms developed from the family, where the father was the head of the household. Monarchical forms of government developed from patriarchal. Democratic forms of government ultimately developed from monarchical forms. And they can all trace their lineage back to what? To the home. To the family. Family is foundational to society. Now here's the question you've got to ask yourself. What happens if the foundation is compromised? If the foundation of your house, no matter how impressive that house may be, if the foundation to your house is compromised, what's going to happen to the structure? If you live in Florida and you build your house over a sinkhole and that sinkhole develops, how long will the house stand? So if marriage and family are foundational to society, and the foundation comes under assault, what is the hope for the future of society? I think this is one of the reasons why marriage and family in particular are under assault these days. And I don't mean under assault simply by the culture. I think really it is a demonic, satanic attack under which the family is under assault today. Uh, and the Apostle Paul certainly believed this as well. You can keep your finger there in 2 Timothy, but turn for a moment to the book of Ephesians. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, that's to the right. And again, let me encourage you to bring your Bibles. I'm not going to give you a dollar like uh, Al Phillips does if you bring your Bible. Um, but, um, you know, won't get you into heaven, but on the other hand, it might help. So Ephesians chapter 6. What I want you to notice is just Ephesians chapter 6 in a, in a big picture way. Ephesians chapter 6 begins with these words, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's how the chapter begins, talking about families about children and parents, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. Well, isn't it interesting that Paul talks about that at the beginning of this chapter, and just a few verses later, he goes on to say, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. I don't think it's any mistake. And remember, there were no chapter divisions in the New Testament originally. These were things that were put in, in the Middle Ages. Paul goes from talking about marriage and family, parents and children, to immediately talking about putting on the full armor of God because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That's no mistake. Paul is telling us that the family is going to be the enemy's number one object. His number one plan of attack will be to undermine family and the family structure, because if you can undermine that, you can undermine the whole of society. 
which ultimately is what his goal is. I don't think there's any mistake or any accident that we look upon our world today and we see societal disarray, confusion, and that corresponds directly with an attack that has taken place over the course, I would say, of the last 50 years upon the family. Upon the family. So, as Christians, we need to understand the importance, the value of family, and the importance of passing on to our children the faith of our fathers. Faith of our fathers living still. That's what we need to pass on to others. Well, the question is this, how do we do that? All right, up to this point, it's academic. How do we do that? Well, that's what I want to try to help you out with a little bit today, but we still need a little bit of education. How do we do this family ministry? Well, the first thing we need to understand is that raising up godly generations is a Christian responsibility. It is a Christian responsibility. Isn't that what God said? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Adam and Eve have a responsibility to bring up godly generations, which means first and foremost, we have to recognize that children are not a commodity to be bought and sold. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Turn, if you will, to the book of Psalms. Easy to find the book of Psalms. Just go to the center of your Bible. Close your Bible, go right to the center, and you're either going to hit Psalms or Proverbs. If you hit Proverbs, go left. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. The psalmist says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Children are a heritage. They are a blessing from the Lord. There are some parts of the world that do not necessarily see that, that children are a blessing. Sometimes children are a hindrance. Oftentimes we want to go on with our lives and children have no place in our plans. I always remind young couples when they come to be married that while not everybody is called to have children, the Bible makes it very clear. The primary purpose, not the only purpose, but the primary purpose of marriage is to do what? To have children, to raise up a godly generation. And incidentally, let me say this, and and this is not to make anybody panic or make anybody feel guilty, but one of the challenges that we face in Western culture is that the Muslims are outstripping us in terms of children. And as it is now, Western Europe will never be able to catch up. As it is right now, Western Europe will never be able to catch up. So it's other parts of the Christian world that are going to have to produce children, raise up godly generations. Otherwise, we will simply be overwhelmed by this threat. And I think it's a real threat, militant Islam, in the world. So we have to understand children are a blessing from the Lord. Furthermore, we have to understand that we are to raise them in the way that they should go. Uh, That's what Proverbs 22, 6, raise up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Raise them up in the way that they should go. And here's a promise. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now, I like that because it says when they're old. It doesn't mean when they're teenagers, they won't depart from it. Uh, we've all known that, but it is a promise. Raise up a child when he, in the ways you go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. That's the hope you see. That if we raise and lay the foundation, of course, we all know we've all wandered away. I stand before you wearing a clerical collar, but I can tell you, I wandered for a while. (laughs) But my parents passed on to me, my mother in particular, I should say, passed on to me a faith. And in times of difficulty, particularly in a very difficult time in my life when my parents were going through a very ugly divorce, it was that faith that sustained me. I had my brother actually turned away from God. I turned away to God in the midst of that crisis. And without going into too much detail, all I can tell you is that that's what made all the difference. It's what made all the difference in our two lives. This is one of the reasons why we pay close attention to what takes place in the baptismal office. One of the questions that is asked on page 301 
in the prayer book is this. Will you be responsible for seeing that the child you present is brought up in the Christian faith and life? And of course, the parents make that promise, but not just the parents. Who else? The godparents. I always tell couples when they come to have their baby baptized, I said, are you pleased with your godparents? Oh, yeah, yeah, we love our godparents. Went to college with them. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. Glad to hear that. What happens at the university stays at the university. I get all that. Oftentimes when we think of godparents, we think that the purpose of a godparent is to do what? Well, if something happens to us, if we're in a car accident, these are the people that are going to raise our child. So we want to make sure that they've got property and money and the means to raise our child in the way to which they become accustomed. That is not the biblical understanding of a godparent. A godparent is a what? A parent in God. So I always say to couples when they come, and they say, well, these are our godparents. I said, are you comfortable with the godparents? Oh, yes. Are you comfortable enough for those, child, for those godparents to interfere in the life of your child. Well, what do you mean by that? Because you see, you're making certain promises to raise up this child in the way that he should go. And what you're saying is, these godparents are here to be parents in God, so that if my husband or I, or my wife and I, fail in our duty, these people have been given public permission to interfere in the life of our child to make sure that it happens. That's what it means to be a God parent. It means to be a parent in God. Now, we're talking about serious stuff now, aren't we? But that's what the Scripture's saying. That is what the church is saying. That children are a blessing from the Lord, and you and I have a responsibility to do what? To raise them in the way that they should go. To ensure that that should happen. And indeed, it's not just the responsibility of the parents and the godparents. We say to the whole congregation, will you who witness these vows do all in your power to support these persons in the life in Christ? And we respond what? We will. We will. In other words, it's the responsibility of the community of faith. It's the responsibility of the church to raise these children in the way that they should go. So we need to understand that children are a blessing from the Lord, first of all. That number two, you and I have a responsibility as Christian parents to raise them in the way that they should go. We need to remember as we do that, that faith, as I've already said, is the greatest gift of all that we can pass on to them. There are many things we want to pass on to our children, but this is the most important thing of all. Jesus himself in Mark chapter 8 says, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Now, that's a question for everybody to ponder. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? If you live for 70, 80, 90 years, but you lose your soul, what does it profit you? Now, here's something else we have to remember. Children are a blessing from the Lord. We have to raise them in the way they should go. And when I say we should raise them, this is not exclusively, but primarily the parent's responsibility. It is the parent's responsibility. Um, some years ago, back in the 1940s, Peter Marshall, anybody ever hear of Peter Marshall? There was a wonderful book written some years ago called A Man Named Peter, and they made a movie out of it. Um, his wife is Catherine Marshall. She's written a number of Christian books and so forth. Peter Marshall was the the U.S. Senate back in the 1940s in the midst of the World War II years, and he was the pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, I mean, Washington, D.C., excuse me. Great church. He was a great preacher, great teacher. I, I've listened to a number of his sermons. You can still find them online. The, the sound quality is not all that great. This is the 1940s, but you can still hear them. And the one that I would commend to you is his sermon entitled, Compromise in Egypt. Compromise in Egypt. If you have children or grandchildren, get online and find Compromise in Egypt by Peter Marshall and listen to that sermon. Basically what he does is he goes back to the story of the Exodus where Moses is called upon to lead the children of Israel out of their captivity in Egypt. And Pharaoh is there and 
Moses appears before him, and Moses says, God has appeared to me, and God says, let my people go. And you all know the story. Pharaoh says, it's not happening. And so what does God do? He begins to bring the plagues, those various plagues upon the Egyptians. And he begins to break Pharaoh's resolve. And after the first of these plagues, Moses goes in and he says, now God has said, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, you may go. But you go and you leave your cattle and your herds here. And Moses comes back and he says, no, we're going and we're taking what's ours with us. No, you're not. More plagues come. Moses appears before Pharaoh again. God says, let my people go. And so what does Pharaoh say? Well, you may go, you take your men, but leave everybody else behind. And Moses says, no, that's not the way it's going to be. We're taking our cattle, we're taking our herds, and we're taking our women. And more plagues come upon the Egyptians. And at one point, and this is what Peter Marshall says, Pharaoh proposes the most insidious compromise of all. Okay, you may go, you may take everything with you, but leave your little ones behind. Leave your little ones behind. You're going to go out there and wander into the wilderness with all of your religious extremism. That's your right to do that if you want to. Go on out there. But do not do that to your children. We can take care of your children better here in Egypt. We're a great society. We've built the pyramids. We can raise your children to be great scholars to be great heroes. You go on out there in the wilderness and and do what you want. If you want to die out there on the peninsula, that's up to you. But leave, for the sake of your children, leave them behind. And you know what Peter Marshall says? He says, many of us have left our children behind in Egypt. Oh, we've made sure they've had the very finest education possible. Finest private schools, the finest universities. We made sure they got their Phi Beta Kappa key. We made sure that their spines were straight and their teeth were straight. Put thousands of dollars into their mouths. They've got braces and they look good. We made sure that if they were walking funny, we made sure they had corrective shoes. We made sure that they had everything that the world could possibly offer. Except God. And as a result, we left our children in Egypt, in paganism. Now, all of those things that I mentioned are not bad in and of themselves. They are all wonderful things. We should care for our children. Give them the best that we possibly can. But to give them all of those things and to fail to give them the one thing that is needful, a relationship with Jesus Christ, is to leave our children in Egypt. It is the parents' responsibility to pass the faith on to their children. It is not the church's responsibility. Nowhere in the scripture do you ever hear that it is the church's responsibility to raise your children. God has entrusted them to you. Now, the church can be a resource for you, but it's not the youth minister's responsibility to do it. He's a resource. It's not the clergy's responsibility. It is the parents' responsibility to raise up their children. And That means parents must set parameters and walls. Now, when I said walls, I almost took this out because walls today is a very controversial subject, as we all know. But think of Charleston when this city was originally founded. It was a walled city. What was it designed to do? To keep people in and to keep other people out. To keep danger out. To keep people safe within. As parents, you and I have a responsibility to set parameters and walls, to keep good in and to keep evil out. That's our duty. That's our responsibility. Here's something else we have to remember as Christians. Love is discipline. Love is discipline. Here's what uh, the author of Hebrews says. Um, If you want to, you can turn to Hebrews This is a good passage to underline in your Bible, uh, just as parents, because sometimes it's hard for us. But Hebrews chapters 12, verses 5 and 6, we read this. 
My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Do not be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Discipline is a good thing. I just came from a town where Paris Island is located, which is the main recruit training depot for the U.S. Marine Corps on the eastern seaboard. And um, at one point, a friend of mine who was the chief of staff at Paris Island took me out at night to see the recruits come in. Boy, that was an experience. All these kids get off, they've got their little earbuds in, and they got their baggy pants, and the next thing they know, they arrive at night, and they're forced to get off. The first thing they get is some man just shouting in their face, screaming at them, ripping out their earbuds. They take them in, they shave their heads, take off all their clothes, they give them a whole new thing. And from that point on, it's hell. That's the best way to describe it. And let me tell you, if you went out and asked a recruit after the first three weeks of training, hey, how's it going? Get me out of here. <laughs> Show me how to get out of here. I'll swim through alligators. Whatever it takes, just get me out of here. Oh, Paris Island, I want out of here. I want to go home to Mama. It's terrifying. And if you asked them, are you, being, are you suffering? They would have said, yeah, I'm suffering. To any purpose? No. <laughs> but you go back on graduation day. When they're standing out there on the tarmac about to receive the Eagle Globe and Anchor, and you ask them if it's all worth it, they're going to tell you, you better believe it's worth it. And it is worth it, because you're training them for what? Well, hopefully to survive. They've got a job to do, perhaps in Iraq or Afghanistan, and you are training them to survive. And if you are soft on them, are you really doing them any favors? Well, the same is true for children. What are we doing? We are training them for life. And do you think life's going to be nice to them? Now, one of the things that many young people do not realize today is mom and dad say, you are the most wonderful child in the world. You are the best. Oh, my, there's no child like you. And then they get out there and discover that everybody else's parents told them the same thing. <laughs> Wait a minute, you can't be the center of the universe because I'm the center of the universe. And if we are doing that, are we actually preparing them for life? Let me tell you, life will gobble them up. And so love is discipline. And here's something else we need to remember as Christians. And that is the stakes are high. This is serious business. This business of raising our children in the way that they should go, of ensuring that they are not left behind in Egypt. In Matthew chapter 18, there is a story told, actually I think it's in Mark chapter 18, where Jesus is coming along and he is teaching and little children come up to him. And at one point, somebody, the disciples, tried to shoo the children away and Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. And then he goes on to explain about children. And he actually says to his disciples, if any of you should put a stumbling block in the face of one of these children, it would be better that a millstone were cast around his neck and he was thrown into the depths of the sea. Jesus took children seriously. And we should too. Now, as we do this, let me just say this, and this will probably be the final note before we break for today. The danger in trying to discipline your children is always, listen to this, in the extremes. One of the things you'll notice about Jesus when Jesus was dealing with his various opponents was that he had two groups that were always sniping at him. The first group were the what? The Pharisees. The second group were the Sadducees. They represent the two extremes within Jewish society of that day. The Pharisees were the legalists. They were the fundamentalists. They took the faith seriously. But they were so legalistic about things that they missed the spirit of the law. On the other end of the spectrum were the Sadducees. 
They were the liberals of the day. They basically didn't believe in anything. They certainly didn't believe in the resurrection. And what is interesting is that Jesus didn't get along with either of them. And I would argue that in the Christian life, that is where the danger is often found. It's found in the extremes, in the extreme right and in the extreme left. And the remarkable thing about Jesus is that Jesus had a perfect balance in his life. When you raise your children in the way that they should go, you've got to find that balance. Oh, you can be so strict with them that what happens? They rebel. I'll tell you a story from my own life. And Paul talks about this. He said, if you lay the law on somebody, the purpose of the law is not to prevent sin. What law does is it reveals sin. When Moses came down off the mountain and he had the Ten Commandments, and the first commandment said, thou shalt have no other gods but me, what did he find the people doing? Worshiping the golden calf. Well, go ahead and give them the Ten Commandments. What's that going to do? It's simply going to reveal the fact that they've already sinned, doesn't it? And oftentimes we find because we have a sin nature within us, when somebody tells us not to do it, that's the very thing we want to do. I'll never forget my mother on Valentine's Day making cupcakes. And she made these cupcakes with those little red hot candies, you know, and she put them on the top of the icing of the cupcakes. And for reasons that are still a mystery to me, my mother said to my brother and I, brother and me, she said, don't stick those red hot candies up your nose. <laughs> now I confess, it had never entered into my mind to stick those red hot candies up my nose. But the minute she said that, my brother and I are thinking, why does she want us to stick those red-hot candies up our... There must be something good about those red-hot candies up your nose. And so what's the first thing my brother did? He was a little more adventurous than I was. He stuck those red-hot candies up his nose. And two seconds later, he's, ah, ah, he's crying. And my mother said, what's wrong with him? I said, he stuck one of those red-hots up his nose. And she said, I told him not to stick those red-hot candies up his nose. That's what sin does, doesn't it? So you can be very strict with your children, and what's going to happen? They're probably going to rebel. On the other hand, you can be so lax with your children that they really don't think you care, that there are no boundaries in life. So somehow we have got to find the balance in the Christian life and guard against those extremes as parents. And it's not an easy thing to do. There's one extreme. <laughs> you all know the scene from The Sound of Music. Captain Von Trapp blows that bosun's whistle and down they come. March down to make their report to the new governess. And that's the way it used to be. Children are to be seen, not heard. Well, that's not the way it is today. What happened? Well, sometime in the 1940s, a fellow by the name of Dr. Benjamin Spock wrote a book called Baby and Child Care. And he argued that children were not to be disciplined, they were to be indulged. And ever since then, we've been indulging them. So we go from Captain Von Trapp to that. <laughs> Wrapping our children in bubble wrap, making sure that they're careful, that they're safe, that they're not harmed, that they're never exposed to the cruel, hard world out there. How do we avoid those extremes and somehow as Christians raise our children in the way that they should go so that when they are old, they won't depart from it? Come back next week and I'm going to give you nine principles, <laughs> nine principles for you to perhaps put into practice in your own lives as parents. And when I do this, I want to say this right now. The Apostle Paul was able to say, join in imitating me. When I put all of this before you today, and when I talk about the principles next week, I am not saying, join in imitating Kristen and Jeff Miller. We are not perfect parents. I'd like to say we are, but we're not. I have a, a, a dear friend, he was a bishop in Africa, and uh, he's a giant of the faith, Bishop Ben Kwashi. And on one occasion, Bishop Kwashi had a son who was just rebelling terribly. 
about ready to renounce his faith. And Bishop Quashie at one point was in his room at night and he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. This boy is going to kill me if I don't kill him first. And his wife turned to him and she said, Ben. She said, you are a great sinner. And I am a great sinner. Would we have angels for children? <laughs> I am a great sinner. My wife is a great sinner. We would not have children for angels or angels for children. So I don't want to give you the impression that what I'm putting forward is, oh, the Millers have got this down pat. We don't. We try to put these principles into practice in the lives of our children with varying degrees of success. But what I will say to you is that these are biblical principles that I'm going to give you next week. And the more we apply them to the lives of our children, the better off they will be the better off the family will be. And as a consequence, the better off society will be. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your grace and for your mercy. And we thank you for families. Lord, there's no such thing as the perfect family. Even the family of God has got its problems. But we trust you, Lord, to come and take your rightful place at the center of our family lives that we may raise our children in the way that they should go, that they may be a blessing to one another, a blessing to the world, a blessing to society. Come, Lord, and teach us as we teach them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.